Hello, good afternoon. My name is Caroline Rose. I'm a senior analyst and the head of the Power Vacuums program here at the New Lines Institute for Strategy and Policy. Thank you all for joining us here at the New Lines Institute for this very exciting talk we are hosting today about the recently published book, America's Great Power Opportunity. We are lucky to have an in-person audience with us today and are also happy to inform you all this, that this event will be recorded and will be uploaded to the New Lines Institute YouTube page shortly after. Uh, of course, I'm thrilled to have the book's author here with us, also in person, uh, to discuss his recent work and its analytical takeaways, Ali Wynn. But a bit about Ali before we jump into questions about the book. He's a senior analyst with the Eurasia Group's global macro geopolitics practice, focusing on US-China relations and great power competition. He served as a junior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, a research assistant at the Belfast Center for Science and International Affairs, and a policy analyst at the Rand Corporation. Ali has been a re non-resident fellow at the Atlantic Council's Stowcroft Center for Strategy and Security and a non-resident fellow at the Modern War Institute. He received a dual, bachelor de dual bachelor's degrees in management science and political science from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and earned his master in public policy from the Harvard Kennedy School. Ali is a term member of the Council on Foreign Relations, a David Rockefeller Fellow with the Trilateral Commission, and a Security Fellow with the Truman National Security Project. He also serves as a member of Foreign Policy for America's Board of Directors and as a member of the American Pakistan Foundation's Leadership Council. Thank you so much for being here with us today, and thank you so much for writing such a fascinating book. My pleasure. Um, Thanks for having me. Abs I was very, very happy to be able to dive into this over the past few weeks, and uh, really, it, it's such an impactful and, and timely book at this time, and I think that, you know, really, really fascinating given, of course, Russia's ongoing offensive in Ukraine, um, recent tensions uh, in the Taiwan Straits, and uh, really, really timely. So thank you so much for writing this. Thank you. I have a few questions for you, and then, of course, we're going to turn to our audience for a few um, questions and answers. Uh, I want to start off with your introduction, how you began researching this book in the first place. And you mentioned how, of course, at first, before the pandemic, you had a particular research style, and then things a bit shifted a bit uh, once the pandemic started. And how even, you know, from the style of your workspace to also how you worked and how you conducted and compiled all of the research for this. Um, you also conducted a number of in, uh, interviews with individuals who now serve in the Biden administration. Where did the inspiration for this book come from? And how did you use that to channel defining what great power competition and U.S. grand strategic interests are? Well, thank you, uh, Carolina. It's, uh, we were just talking beforehand. I can't believe this is the first time we're meeting. Better late than never. I'm glad, <laughs> yes. but I'm glad that we're meeting in person. But we've been you know, digitally connected through email and Twitter for a number of years. But it's uh, really an honor and privilege to be here with you and to finally meet you in person, uh, better late than never. Um, so I, you know, I've been thinking about great power competition. I think like many others, I've been thinking about the term, I think, in earnest um, since the publication of the 2017 National Security Strategy and then a month later, the 2018 National Defense Strategy. So these are two documents published by the Trump administration that really catapult great power competition. And I think it, it achieves escape velocity. So prior to 2017 and 2018, I don't want to give the impression that great power competition was a term that was dwelling in obscurity, but it hadn't achieved that escape velocity. And I think but I think that I would say there's one inflection point and then one trend that begin to give it some life and then those two documents, it really takes off. Inflection point, uh, Russia's incursion into Ukraine and then its annexation of Crimea in 2014, um, you begin to see a real uptick in mentions of great power competition in the scholarly literature, in mainstream opinion. Um, and then uh, in terms of a trend, China's steady campaign of land reclamation in the South China Sea. So this uh, discrete moment of uh, Russia's incursion, uh, this trend, China's uh, land reclamation in the South China Sea, collectively, uh, scholars start paying more attention, policymakers start paying more attention. Um, but in the second term of the Obama administration, it had started gaining some resonance, but I think it was particularly within the Department of Defense. It didn't really gain, it didn't really diffuse beyond the Pentagon. Um, then with 27, the, the 2017 NSS and the 2018 uh, NDS, uh, they not only become, they not only take center stage within the Pentagon, but I would say across the interagency basis, basis. And importantly, 
Um, it achieves, I keep using this term escape velocity to suggest that it wasn't just in the government. Um, the term really, really uh, became uh, central to mainstream discourses more generally. So in, in the think tank community, in, in just op-eds and newspapers. And, um, and I said to myself that as somebody who's interested in U.S. foreign policy, is interested in, in world affairs, I better get a handle on this term if I want to understand what policymakers are concerned about, what think tankers are concerned about. I better get a handle on the term. So I started, I started doing research just in the way that I, I suspect most other folks would. So I read as much literature mentioning the term great power competition as I could. Um, I interviewed the, the, some of the intellectual architects behind great power competition. I just wanted to absorb as much material as I could. And because the term was so ubiquitous, my, you know, my presumption was that you know, the more ubiquitous a term is, presumably there's some shared understanding of what it means. So I, I assumed that there would be a shared definition. I assumed that there would be some shared consensus on its implications for U.S. For US foreign policy. And what I discovered was, and I, I believe I, I mentioned in the book, is that there was a significant gap between the ubiquity of the term on the one hand and the underspecification of the term on the other. Well, what do I mean? Um, at a broad level, so kind of from a, you know, at a, at a 30,000 foot level, when I would ask individuals, what does great power competition mean? Uh, at a bird's eye level, there's some general sense of what it means. So great power competition means that interstate competition, it never went away. It's more acute now. The United States is relatively not as preeminent today as it was at the end of the Cold War. Uh, we have now two principal nation state competitors, a resurgent China and a revanchist Russia, and they're more able and more willing today to push back against U.S. influence. So at a broad level, you know, wherever you sit along the ideological spectrum, whatever school of international relations to which you subscribe, most observers agree with that basic description. But if you then ask, okay, given that diagnosis or given that description, what are the implications? So going from description to prescription, there's a lot of disagreement over what the implications are for U.S. foreign policy. And what I found, and then maybe I'll stop here, um, what I found is that the more I, the more I probed, the more research I did, the more individuals with whom I spoke, the more and the more that just time passed, the more I got the sense that individuals' understandings of great power implications, great power competition's implications, they were becoming more and more expansive, more and more encompassing, more and more to the point of becoming maximalist. And so now it's very common to hear the great power competition means that the United States, on the one hand, with its allies and partners in tow, is squaring off against China, Russia, this authoritarian entente, uh, to shape nothing less than the contours of world order. Now, you may accept that diagnosis, and it's indeed true that the United States is increasingly competing with China and Russia globally, uh, systemically, in a, in a range of functional domains, in a range of geographical theaters. The difficulty is that if your remit is to compete with two formidable external competitors to shape world order, the question is not so much what to do, but what not to do, because it's such a, it's such a broad mandate, and what I worry about is that that broad of a mandate, it really militates against strategic discipline. The essence of strategy is that even the world's preeminent power cannot escape the necessity for choice. Even the world's preeminent power has to say, has to accept certain difficult trade-offs, has to say that we will prioritize certain issues more than others, certain regions more than others. But if your remit is the world, literally, um, it becomes harder to exercise that kind of discipline. I'm going to jump a few questions because I think you touch upon uh, a I really went on key. Too long. <laughs> no, not at all. No, this is this is fantastic because sure. there was a there was a, a point in the book uh, towards the end where you talk about this kind of maximalist assumption beyond great power competition serving as somewhat of a buzzword. I think for many administrations as well as of course the foreign policy apparatus here in Washington. And when not only do you have to define it, but then you also have to define what it shouldn't be as well as what it should be. And, and you talk, there's a, there's a quote towards the end that I really enjoyed in the book that was talking about how because China and, and Russia may be pushing influence, encroaching uh, on, on particular sectors of interest in the United States, it doesn't always necessitate a U.S. response. It can be, of course, competitive cooperation as well. Mm -hmm. And you talk about that kind of other side of the coin with great power competition where there's, of course, space for competition, but also there is a space for uh, cooperation that the United States has failed to recognize and many key opportunities. Where do you see those opportunities down the road? 
where is that space for cooperation? How should the United States really approach great power competition to ensure that not only is it not really escalating, um, you know, this dynamic with great power rivals, but then also ensure, ensuring that it's using its position in, in, in the international system in a proactive and productive way? So, such an important question and, and a really difficult question, and I should say in full candor, it's a question that I continue, gra I think we all continue to grapple with. So, I mean, I'll be honest, I mean, right now, I mean, if you look at the trend lines of the U.S.-China relationship and the U.S.-Russia relationship, you know, I, I think I would be naive to suggest that there are massive cooperative vistas. Mm -hmm. I think that right now, um, it's, it's slim pickings. We have to be honest, it's slim pickings right now. Uh, right now, I mean, just to... So I'll, I'll take the U.S.-Russia relationship first and, th and then turn to the U.S.-China relationship. Uh, with the United States and Russia right now, I mean, even on, even on self-evident areas of, of uh, I think, self-evidently necessary uh, areas of cooperation, such as, say, arms control, uh, it's going to be very difficult to, um, to e eke out even minimal cooperation. Uh, certainly at a public level, I think that just the domestic politics in, in Washington and Moscow are, are obviously not conducive to cooperation. So then the question becomes, um, if there is going to be any cooperation, uh, likely it'll have to be done quietly and privately because, again, publicly, just the domestic politics are just too toxic. So then the question becomes, what can be done quietly and privately? Um, two, uh, are there opportunities below perhaps sort of the level, sort of the presidential level or perhaps below the, the level of very, very high-ranking officials? Are there working groups that might, again, quietly and privately be able to pursue certain areas of, of cooperation? But again, I, I think we're talking about uh, slim pickings. And so the, the question, I think, in the, in the case of the United States and Russia for the time being, uh, you, you do hold out hope that, again, quietly and privately, there may yet be opportunities for cooperation on, on shared vital national interests. But I think that right now the question is, before we can talk about even minimal great power cooperation, can we avoid great power war? And a lot of the discussion in the book, I, I think it should be self-evident, um, any discussion of great power cooperation, any discussion of America's pursuing a great power opportunity, is predicated upon the avoidance of great power war. So I think that in the, in the case of the United States and Russia, what can we do to avoid a direct armed confrontation, recognizing that this Russia-Ukraine war, it's becoming more and more this grinding war of attrition. It is escalating. Uh, there are more and more points of potential friction between NATO forces and Russian forces. But what can the United States and China, what can the United States and Russia do to avoid great power war? And I think that that has to be right now sort of the, the animating question of all discussions involving the United States and Russia. With the United States and China, I think that there are, the relationship is, is deteriorating, but it's not, uh, it hasn't experienced, at least as far as I can tell, uh, the kind of rupture that the U.S.-Russia relationship has experienced. Again, it is, it is trending downwards, and certainly, as you alluded to, or not alluded to, you mentioned, just the uptick recently in, in cross-strait tensions. It's a very challenged relationship, but at least uh, there is right now a shared leader-level desire to maintain dialogue. So uh, you had, uh, you know, you had a conversation you know, recently between Deputy Secretary of State Wendy Sherman uh, and China's ambassador to the United States, uh, which is good. We want that high-level dialogue to continue. Uh, it appears the Wall Street Journal reported the other day that preparations are underway for some kind of in-person meeting between President Biden and President Xi uh, later this fall, I believe, on the sidelines of the G20 summit uh, to be hosted uh, in Bali. And uh, that's good. Uh, I, I know I, one, something that frustrates me a little bit about some of the readouts from these meetings is uh, you often, whenever, pre and President Biden and President Xi have had a number of calls now, and invariably the analyses uh, following these calls say the call underscored how tense the relationship is, how little the United States and China can cooperate on, and it really underscores how, how difficult it will be for these two great powers to make progress. Um, and my feeling is that the continuation of difficult conversations is infinitely preferable to the absence of any conversation. Um, I would be much more concerned if the two leaders weren't talking at all, or if they were being advised not to talk at all. Uh, it's to President Biden's credit that President Biden has said, uh, and even before, even on the campaign trail, you know, uh, on the campaign trail and even as, as president, he often has said, uh, I have spent a lot of time with, with Xi Jinping. We've had conversations. Uh, that's good. You want to have leaders who appreciate the imperative of dialogue, especially because, um, I mean, dialogue is good in, in any relationship, uh, whether it's a, a vibrant relationship, a healthy relationship. You always want to have dialogue. But dialogue, the worse a relationship becomes, the more strained a relationship becomes, the more imperative dialogue becomes. Okay. And so my feeling is, 
uh, even if the dialogue is strained, even if it doesn't bear sort of headline grabbing fruit, um, if conversation one creates a groundwork for conversation two, good. Um, if conversation one produces some impetus for working group level conversation, good. Uh, and I think that in the case of the United States and China, they, there are, even though the cooperative possibilities are still, I think, slim pickings, I still think that there are some opportunities, more so than exist right now in the U.S.-Russia case. So, um, and Secretary of State Antony Blinken, he enumerated a number of these areas in his much-awaited uh, uh, China speech uh, a, a few months ago. And so uh, combating or mitigating, I should say, food insecurity, a shared imperative. I mean, you look at the droughts right now that are taking place in, in China. So a shared interest in mitigating food insecurity, a shared interest in mitigating climate change, a shared interest in mobilizing not only to deal with scar tissue from COVID-19, but to prepare for the next pandemic, uh, shared interest in mitigating uh, energy disruptions. So it's a long list. Um, but I think, again, uh, you have to avoid great power war. And I, and I know it sounds almost, I, I'm, I'm, I really don't intend to be uh, facetious, but I, I think uh, we're in dangerous times. And so I think it's, it's important to underscore, uh, you, you have to get the basics right. You have to avoid war. Uh, so you have to avoid war, assuming you avoid war, and I believe that we can and we must, uh, then we can begin talking about co cooperative possibilities. I'll just make one last point uh, and, and then I'll stop. Uh, I think that uh, another prerequisite for cooperation is the recognition, I shouldn't say recognition, but I think the appreciation of the likelihood uh, that China and Russia are unlikely to collapse in spectacular fashion. Uh, they're likely to prove enduring powers. And I think that the sooner that the great powers, and it's not just the United States vis-a-vis -vis China and Russia, I think it's also China and Russia vis-a-vis -vis the United States. The sooner that the great powers recognize that power transitions are probably unlikely, but strained cohabitations are more likely, and that you're going to have to find a way to coexist in perpetuity, the sooner then you can get down to the brass tacks of actually cooperating. I think the United States is not going to be able to achieve a decisive victory over China. It's not even clear what victory would mean in, the, in this context. China is not going to be able to, I, I would argue, um, consign the United States to a position of, of, uh, of, mar of a marginal position in world affairs. And so these are great powers. They have competitive advantages that the other can't necessarily readily replicate. The, I think it's likely that, the, that they are going to have to cohabitate in perpetuity. The question is, um, do you have the political will and the strategic impetus to begin that journey, that very arduous and, and ambiguous and painful journey towards forging that cohabitation? And then what do the parameters of that cohabitation look like? Absolutely. Uh, you know, you, you also, of course, mention in the book uh, the flip side, you know, China and, and, and Russia's strategy and, and some occasional uh, cooperation in, of course, approaching the United States. Do you think that that dynamic and that relationship is going to strengthen down the line? Or do you think that limited cooperation and ensuing dialogue, like you mentioned, um, will that really poke a hole in that dynamic between Russia and China? So, I mean, my answer is, is going to be, it'll be a very impoverished answer because I feel that depending on the day that, depending on the day that I'm contemplating the, you know, this question, you know, I, I probably would have a different answer. So I'll give you sort of my answer as of August 24th, 2022. I, I do think that, so I'll, I'll, sub, I'll submit, or I'll, I'll, I'll set forth two propositions. One, to the extent that fissures do emerge in the Sino-Russian relationship, I think that they're likely to emerge from within, not as a result of external pressure. Uh, the United States, for a while now, has thought about, so prior to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the thinking was, how can the United States prevail upon Russia to loosen its embrace of China? And now, as a result of Russia's barbarity in Ukraine, it's, the question has become, how can the United States prevail upon China to loosen its embrace of Russia? So it's an interesting kind of reversal. Um, I don't think that sort of wedge strategies that are, are orchestrated by the United States are likely to bear much fruit. So uh, if there are fissures that emerge, it's likely going to be because China recalibrates its thinking about Russia or, or the other way around. So, so proposition one would be, um, you know, I think that the United States should be thinking about ways in which it can uh, prevent China and Russia from hastening or from, from uh, accelerating the deepening of their entente rather than thinking about ways in which you can actively pry them apart. I, I, I think that it's the more that the United States conveys that intention or that desire to pry them apart, I think the more likely, they're to, the more likely they will be to draw to, uh, together. Uh, but proposition two is that uh, I think that the Sino-Russian relationship, and, and I had a conversation a few days ago in which I tried to articulate this point probably poorly, but I'll, let me, I'll try to do a little bit better today. Um, I think that the relationship is paradoxical in the sense that it is stronger 
but I think it's also more strained, and I'll, I'll try to explain what I mean. I think it's stronger by default, not just because China and Russia share a number of uh, grievances against the United States and against the West, against the, po the configuration of the post-war order. It's stronger by default because Russia's invasion of Ukraine has made it more beholden to China. So if you're Russia, as a result of your invasion of Ukraine, uh, your relationships with the West are largely going to be ruptured so long as Vladimir Putin is at the helm. Uh, and so you are uh, and facing diplomatic isolation from significant stretches of the West, facing a very, very significant sanctions regime imposed by the West, you're going to be more beholden to China. So uh, in a way, Russia, by virtue of, I, I think, a really uh, quite uh, colossal strategic error, has driven itself further into China's embrace. And China and Russia certainly are, you know, publicly, they're doubling down on their, so they said shortly before Russia's invasion of Ukraine, they signed that joint statement saying that our friendship has no limits. They're doubling down, and China, rather than condemning Russian aggression, it's doubling down on saying that NATO, should have, uh, NATO shouldn't have expanded after the Cold War, that the United States should have taken uh, more fully into account Russia's concerns about Eastern Europe's security architecture. And yet, I would have to imagine, um, I would have to imagine that Xi Jinping and his top advisors are thinking, the longer this war goes on, uh, the, more, the more of an economic cost it's going to impose on China, the more reputational cost it's going to impose on China, the more it's going to strain China's already strained relationships with advanced industrial democracies, which even well before Russia's invasion of Ukraine were already trending in the wrong direction. My sense, and again, you know, only, you know, only Xi and Putin know what they spoke about, and we can, only, we can speculate. My guess is that when Xi and Putin spoke prior to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, my guess is that Xi probably was convinced that Russia was either indeed just going to launch a special military operation, or that if Russia did indeed launch a full-fledged invasion, that Ukraine would capitulate very quickly. So it would, be, it would be a very quick affair, it would be a very bloodless affair. And it would be so quick and so bloodless that the West wouldn't have time to mobilize a response. So I think that Xi Jinping was probably hoping that regardless of what, whatever Russia ended up doing, that basically China would be able to respond in the same kind of circumspect way that it responded to what Russia did in 2014. So, you know, China was circumspect about Russia's incursion into Ukraine in 2014. It didn't approve it. It didn't condemn it. It was, it was kind of quiet. But obviously the war didn't pan out that way. Russia got bogged down. Uh, it's this grinding war of attrition. Uh, it's causing all kinds of externalities in terms of food insecurity, energy disruption. The West has had ample time to arm Ukraine, to impose a sanctions regime. And, and you have many prominent, even though, of course, Xi Jinping and his top advisors are not saying so, but you do have many prominent Chinese international relations scholars. Take you know, John Shui Tong uh, from Ch uh, Tsinghua University. He writes an essay in Foreign Affairs in which he says, that uh, China's, relationships in the, uh, China's relationships with the West are going to be far more integral to its long-term strategic outlook than its relationship with Russia. And so you do have more and more Chinese international relations scholars saying, gosh, we're at the six-month mark. It's already been this disruptive to energy markets, to food markets. It already has been this much of a reputational burden for China. What happens if this war goes on for another six months and then another six months? And so I think that, yes, the Sino-Russian relationship, it is strengthening. But I have to imagine that, one, there's some apprehension in Beijing about the long-term impact of this entente if the war continues, number one. Uh, number two, if I'm Russia, uh, I don't think that Russia wants to be in a position in which it is yet more beholden to China than it already was. I'll just make one last point. Even though China and Russia, they say that their friendship has no limits, uh, I do think that in practice it does have you know, some limits. And if you just look at, uh, leaving aside uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, even prior to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, uh, look at how China and Russia responded to America's withdrawal from Afghanistan. Uh, and actually we're, we're marking now roughly sort of the one-year anniversary of America's withdrawal from Afghanistan. So when the United States withdrew uh, roughly a year ago, there was a lot of, and, and as, as was to be expected, there was a lot of schadenfreude in Beijing and Moscow saying the Taliban have finally defeated the United States, the world's great superpower has been humbled, you know, the Soviet Union lost in Afghanistan, ha-ha, so did the United States. There was a lot of crowing, there was a lot of glowing, there was a lot of schadenfreude, and yet that schadenfreude over time gave way to more circumspection and more caution, uh, in part because China and Russia, they don't, have nece they don't have fully aligned views of how Central Asia should work. Russia believes that Central Asia is within its proper sphere of influence, and it's nervous that China is now encroaching more economically. Uh, and Russia's invasion of Ukraine now has made a lot of Central Asian countries, I think notably Kazakhstan, say, well, we've seen the way that Russia has destabilized its neighborhood. We've seen Russia's weaponization of energy 
do we want to do we want to be this closely aligned with Russia? So now those countries are starting to sort of look more towards China. Uh, China wants to reduce India's role in Central Asia. Russia wants to deepen its relationship with India. So I think that yes, the relationship is growing stronger, but in many ways it's more strained. China and Russia don't have wholly consonant views of how Central Asia should be organized, how South Asia should be organized. They don't have wholly consonant approaches to the United States. And so um, I think that in due course, over time, there is a possibility that those strains will surface uh, more visibly. Uh, but I don't think that if those strains surface more visibly, it will be the result of US pressure. It will be more the result of independent calculations that Beijing and or Moscow make. Absolutely. In the book, and I know that you wrote an additional chapter after <laughs> the, the yes. Russian offensive uh, and the Russian war in, in Ukraine began, um, and you know that certainly is incredibly reflective of all right. How does great power competition have to shift to respond to this? Uh, recent events, of course, we've seen Ukraine prominently featured in the United States. Perhaps it's not its great power competition strategy, but its uh, its policy towards Russia and China. And in an op-ed that Nancy Pelosi wrote when she visited Taiwan, she even mentioned this. Um, particularly in, in China's handling of human rights uh, and then, of course, respect to the Taiwanese people along the lines of authoritarianism and, uh, you know, the, the democracy promotion. And I think that that's something, it's something I wanted to ask. What, by connecting Ukraine in, for example, in Taiwan, along with, you know, competing with China and Russia across the international system, do you see that as a successful strategy that the United States is employing, or do you think that it has uh, shortcomings to it by, of course, featuring Ukraine as a prominent uh, connector of, of, of this strategy? Or do you think this needs to change? Do you think that it needs to be a bit more principles-based uh, rather than uh, centered around one event and one crisis? So I would make, I think, sort of uh, two points that come to mind. Uh, you know, the first point is that I think, uh, and, and maybe before talking about uh, the United States, well, actually, actually, I'll begin with the U.S. point. So I think it's important that even though, you know, we were just talking about that, yes, China and Russia are drawing, uh, you know, their embrace is tightening, but China and Russia do pose, and I, and I try to make this point in the book, um, even though I wrote the body of the book before Russia's invasion of Ukraine, I, I think that this point still broadly obtains. China and Russia, broadly, they still do pose significantly different competitive challenges. And I do think that it's important recognizing, yes, that they are America's principal nation state competitors. Yes, they are strengthening their relationship. Yes, they are inveighing more vigorously against U.S. influence and the U.S.-led order, so on and so forth. But they still, on balance, pose very different challenges. Um, Russia is substantially less integrated into the international system than China is. It's economically far less. It's, it's, it's not a trivial economy, but relatively, is, I think China's economy is well over 10 times as large. So it's not as economically consequential as China. I think that Russia is also, in part, because it's not as integrated into the international system, it's more risk-taking than China is. And so the upshot is that the way that Russia attempts to exercise influence is going to be different than the way that China attempts to exercise influence. Now, China has obviously, as we've seen in, in recent weeks, it has conducted very, very provocative, very destabilizing actions vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan. So I don't want to give the, I certainly wouldn't want to convey the impression that, you know, only Russia engages in destabilizing behavior. China certainly does as well. Uh, but I think that on balance, Russia is, um, Russia feels that it can, Russia is much more prone to believing that it can exercise, that it can accumulate and then exercise substantial influence via destabilization. And so I think that any hopes that Russia might have had of exercising influence, strengthening its long-term outlook by reintegrating itself into the post-Cold War order, and I think here 2007 is an important inflection point. Putin's famous you know, speech at the Munich Security Conference, it really sort of, um, he talks about uh, the, what he believes to be the injustices of the U.S.-led post-war order, and it really is kind of this, this I, I think, turning point in how Russia views the West, how Russia views the international system. But Russia is much more risk-taking. I think it's much more likely to pose acute short-term uh, challenges. I do think that China, by virtue of its relatively, uh, its, its, uh, its comparable lack of risk-taking because of its integration into the international system, because of its longer-term ambitions, um, it poses a different kind of challenge. So, so point one is that I do think that the United States, while recognizing certain commonalities in, say, regime type, certain commonalities in terms of shared grievances against the United States, um, it is important as much as possible not to not to conflate the challenges, not to treat China and Russia as being 
kind of a unitary authoritarian challenge, but they're distinct challenges. That would be point one. The second point I want to make is that one linkage between sort of Russia's invasion of Ukraine and China's handling of cross-strait tensions is, I think that in many ways, uh, when I think about Russia, when I think about China, their greatest competitor in many ways is not the United States, it's themselves. Um, one of the points that I try to make in, in the book is that, you know, China and Russia, they are, uh, they're formidable challengers. They are multidimensional challenges, and I think that they're challenges that are likely to endure, probably in perpetuity. I, I don't think that they're going to go the way of the Soviet Union. I think that they're going to adapt, they're going to muddle through. So, and I do think that, and I should say, yes, I think it's true that in the aftermath of the Cold War, perhaps between the end of the Cold War and the onset of the global financial crisis, I think it's fair to say that the United States veered too far in the direction of complacence. There was too much of a feeling of triumphalism. There was, there was too little appreciation for the potential for the Chinas and the Russias of the world to, in due course, come back and, and reassert their influence. Uh, but in, whether in, uh, you know, in, in geopolitics and in many other realms of life, there is a possibility for the pendulum to, to overcorrect. Complacence was a mistake, so was consternation. Uh, China and Russia, the, you know, many observers have rendered some version of this quip. They're not two feet tall, but they're not ten feet tall. And I think that we don't want to if we don't want to understate their competitive acumen, we also don't want to aggrandize it because that aggrandizement, it not only discounts the possibility that China and Russia make mistakes, um, I think it also fuels, it fuels a certain anxiety that informs then a more reactionary defense of U.S. foreign policy. Um, uh, and I should say just by way of a little bit of a personal digression, you know, when I was writing the book, one of the narratives that I encountered over and over and over again in, in my research, in my conversations, there was a sense that China and Russia, they're kind of these strategic grandmasters. You know, the United States, it only thinks in two or four year increments. You know, China and Russia, you know, they peer far into the future. They're really just outclassing the United States strategically. And I think that what we've seen is that, albeit in different ways, that they, both China and Russia, I think, have, by virtue of their own actions in different ways, have kind of, I think, punctured that narrative. You know, I'll begin with Russia and then I'll turn to China. So Russia with its invasion of Ukraine, sure, it has reminded the rest of the world that it matters. It's reminded the world that it is a formidable power, it's a nuclear armed power, and it's reminded the rest of the world that you can't, you can't ignore it. Uh, because if you ignore it, it can invade a sovereign country, it can wreak havoc on energy markets, it can wreak havoc on food markets. Actually, you know, prior to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, I hadn't actually, I had, I had appreciated Russia's significance in global energy markets, but I actually hadn't appreciated Russia's significance within global food markets. And we're seeing now the kinds of havoc, uh, the havoc that Russia is, is, is wreaking. So Russia matters, and it is, it is, to any observers who might have discounted its relevance prior to its invasion, it's offered a very brutal corrective this year. Having said that, in affirming its enduring relevance, I think it's done so at a pretty significant cost to its own strategic outlook. So as I mentioned earlier, it's more beholden to China, which is not a position you want to be in if you're Russia. Uh, Russia has given NATO a new lease on life, so NATO is now poised to admit two new members. Uh, it has given the Transatlantic Project a new lease on life, so the European Union has granted membership candidate status to two countries, Ukraine and Moldova. Um, and even though Russia is presently blunting the impact of sanctions, those sanctions over the medium to long term, they are going to begin to bite more. They are going to begin to curtail Russia's access to capital and technology that it will require for its own long-term economic development. So, yes, you've affirmed your relevance. You have demonstrated that the rest of the world can ignore you, but if, if the objective of strategy is to make you, is to advance your national interests, is to make you more integral to world affairs, is to advance your long-term capacity to replenish your competitive advantages and your long-term ability to renew your strengths at home and abroad, I, I think it's very difficult to make the case that Russia has strengthened itself uh, over the long run with its invasion of Ukraine. It's very interesting to get a sense of, I, I think, how significantly Russia has undercut itself. If you go back to 2011, then Prime Minister Putin, um, he wrote an article in which he, he articulated his proposal for a Eurasian economic union centered on Russia, and he envisioned Russia as being this thriving, vibrant economic intermediary between the West and the East. Uh, I, I think that those days, if for the time being, are, are long gone. Uh, and then take China. Now, China is certainly, uh, it's not as blundering. It's, it's not as blundering. It's not as risk-taking. And by virtue of its economic heft and its technological capacity, it's able to cultivate far more influence globally than, than Russia can. Uh, but even uh, China, I think, has comported itself in ways that I, I think from a strategic perspective, betray a certain strategic myopia. So if you rewind the clock to, say, about two years ago, maybe two and a half years ago, I mean, you remember the headlines around, say, end of first quarter of 2020, beginning of, first, uh, beginning of the second quarter of 2020. The narratives were, 
China has contained COVID at home. It's contained the economic fallout of COVID at home. And having done so, it's now training its sites outwards. And it's shipping teams of doctors to countries in distress. It's shipping uh, personal protective equipment kits to countries in distress. But China really was presenting itself as being a sort of a model of competence. It's confidently dealing with crisis, a crisis at home. It's confidently now helping the rest of the world. What was the narrative about the United States? The narrative about the United States was it's completely mismanaging COVID-19. Uh, it, there's this fast-moving recession that it can't get under control. It's being convulsed by protests against racial injustice. The, the disparity could not, the narrative disparity could not have been more stark. And my thought was, my fear was, that given that discrepancy in narratives, I said to myself, China really now has, sort of again, at the end of the first quarter of 2020, beginning of second quarter of 2020, I said to myself, China really has the United States where it wants it. And I said to myself, I kind of, and I posit, I believe I posit, posit this thought experiment in the book, I said, imagine if, contrary to what it ultimately ended up doing, I said, imagine if, given that discrepancy in narratives, imagine if China had said, you know, we have the United States where we want it. We're going to, not indefinitely, but temporarily, we're going to press pause on cracking down on Hong Kong. We're going to press pause on coercing Taiwan. We're going to take steps to stabilize our relations with Australia, India, and Japan so that we can kind of neuter the quad. We're going to get this comprehensive agreement on investment across the finish line with the European Union, and we're going to try to take some steps to stabilize our relationship with the United States. Oh, and by the way, let's also see if we can relieve some debt to uh, participating countries in the Belt and Road Initiative. I think if China had taken any of those steps, uh, let alone the full, for the full panoply of steps, if China had taken any of those steps, I think we would be having a very different conversation about China's role in the world. And I think that China would have succeeded in bringing its diplomatic stature substantially more into alignment with its economic heft. China basically took, whether, whether out of anxiety, hubris, reactive defensiveness, whatever, you know, your, whatever your hypothesis might be, China ultimately went in basically exactly the opposite direction, such that now, even though China today is more economically central than it was prior to the onset of the coronavirus pandemic, its major power relationships, with, its, with the exception of its relationship with Russia, virtually all of them have deteriorated. The United States, wants to, on a bipartisan basis, wants to strengthen relations with Taiwan. The European Union is recalibrating its disposition towards China. NATO, in 2019, in a very kind of anodyne, bland way, NATO said in 2019, 2019, by the way, was the first time that NATO even mentioned China in a formal document after its London summit. And I think it said something to the effect of, China's rise presents challenges and opportunities. It was a very kind of you know, mild statement. You look at its new strategic concept, it says, China, I'm again roughly paraphrasing, but you know, China's stated ambitions and coercive conduct present clear challenges to our, our values and our interests. Very, very stark departure in language. Um, you look at the Quad. The Quad was muddled, prior to the pandemic, it was kind of muddling along as one of these other kind of alphabet soup abstractions. It now is proceeding with very clear momentum. So China, again, has, com has comported itself in a way that kind of belies this notion of its much vaunted strategic acumen. So again, just to recap, um, in a, a very, very convoluted and long-winded answer to your question, but the first point is, even as China and Russia draw closer together, uh, I still think it's, it's useful analytically and pres prescriptively uh, to disaggregate the competitive challenges and to recognize that they challenge U.S. influence and they challenge the international system in different ways and therefore require different responses. Um, but also to recognize that China and Russia, they're not immune from strategic hubris. They do make mistakes. Um, and I'll just make you know, one last you know, comment. Uh, you know, you obviously, I mean, anything I say on, on the Middle East and, the Centra and Central Asia, I defer to you entirely. Uh, but, you know, one, uh, one very humble observation would be, um, I don't, it's not clear to me that China and Russia, now that the United States is trying to sort of rebalance its strategic equities away from the Middle East, away from Central Asia, it's not clear to me that China and Russia, they're just going to sort of swoop in and that they will be immune from any kinds of headaches. I'm mean, going to take Afghanistan. You look at Afghanistan, it's a very good example. So there was this, there was this narrative that once the United States leaves, you know, China's just going to swoop in, but China's recognizing now that, well, um, our invest, if we make investments in Afghanistan, given how unstable the geopolitical climate is, it's not clear that our investments will be secure. Um, we have to deal with the Taliban. We're wary of the Taliban for historical reasons. Um, the Islamic State's uh, Afghanistan-based affiliate doesn't have, uh, doesn't have any love loss for the Taliban. They're launching attacks. And so they, and, and they actually, one of the reasons that ISIS-K has been so critical of the Taliban is for, for being, in their view, too friendly with China. Um, so China has actually been kind of circumspect. China hasn't necessarily just swooped into Afghanistan. It realizes that actually it was kind of nice when the United States was bogged down in Afghanistan. And we could, 
um, we could advance certain economic interests, but the United States had to deal with the Taliban. The United States had to deal with counterterrorism and counterinsurgency. We didn't have to. Um, and so I, I think all a way of saying that you know, China and Russia, they're not immune from strategic hubris, hubris. They will make mistakes. They do make mistakes. They have made mistakes. And again, I, I think kind of an undercurrent of the, I shouldn't say an undercurrent, really sort of a, one of the core messages of the book is how can the United States, in, in conducting its foreign policy, how can it find this place of kind of competitive equipoise? How does it find that middle ground between understating the competitive potential of China and Russia and overstating it? How does it find a, a middle ground between complacence and consternation? How does it avoid being insouciant, but how does it also avoid being alarmist? Um, and that's why ultimately one of the messages that I try to articulate is, you know, the United States, it can influence what China and Russia do, but it can't unilaterally dictate to countries of those proportions what they do. Uh, the United States only has full control over two phenomena. It has full control over what it does, and it has full control over what it elects not to do. But outside of those two phenomena, it doesn't have, it's not omnipotent. And so I think that the more that the United States can right-size the competitive challenges from China and Russia, the more that the United States focuses on what it does fully control, the more the United States focuses on renewing its competitive advantages at home and abroad. What I would like to see is a U.S. foreign policy that is minimally susceptible to the decisions of its competitors. And I think that the more that the United States focuses on renewing itself at home and abroad and thinking about how do we, how do we achieve situations of strength, that's one of these uh, sort of phrases in kind of the U.S. foreign policy discourse, how do we achieve and sustain situations of strength so that regardless of what China, Russia, or any other competitor does, the United States is steadily positioned? And I think that the more it focuses on its own renewal, the more confidence it will project to its allies and partners that it believes in its regenerative capacity, the more it will signal to China and Russia that they're not going to be able to throw it off course. And I think that the more it'll be able to push back against some of the narratives that I think we see increasingly gaining sway, that it's sort of the 1930s again, China and Russia, these authoritarians are stealing the march, stealing a march, the international system is in collapse, the United States and democracies are on their back foot, the more it'll be able to push back on those narratives, and narratives, by the way, that are very crucial to shaping the decisions that policymakers make. Absolutely. And, and getting back to that one point that I really enjoyed in the book, too, is uh, you, you described the United States' occasional uh, behavior of creating peripheral uh, contests and also creating and manufacturing incidents where it gives it, quote, an illusion of purpose. And so my final question before we turn to our audience, how, how can the United States really stay the course with this? Identify the substantive, um, real spaces of competition that deserve and necessitate an American response, while also steering clear of some of these sidetracked, manufactured, uh, competitive spaces where it might seem immediate, but is not. It doesn't does not necess necessitate an American response. How how do we avoid that? How do we stay up the course? How does the Biden administration think through that dilemma? It's incredibly hard, and I and again. Uh, you know, one of the you know one of the points that has you know coming up has come up since I published the book is so since I published the book we've had this uptick in cross strait tensions. You have to pay attention to that. Uh, you can't pretend that it doesn't exist. And so and I so I do want to convey that um, uh, invariably and understandably and properly a substantial segment of U.S. foreign policy it is going to be reactive. You are you you know you don't conduct foreign policy in a vacuum. Uh, uh, you have shocks to the international system, such as the coronavirus pandemic and Russia's invasion of Ukraine. You have to respond. You have, you know, you had a very perilous situation across the, uh, the Taiwan Straits. You have to respond. You have to manage those tensions. So you have to manage events, crises, tensions as they arise. So um, what the book tries to argue is not that the United States can or should formulate foreign policy in a vacuum. It can't and it shouldn't. And a significant part of your foreign policy is going to be reactive. But to the extent possible, what can we do recognizing that perhaps even the, the majority of your foreign policy is going to be reactive? What can we do to maximize that window for proactive thinking and for proactive foreign policy? And so what I try to, and so by way of kind of answering that question, and, I, and I hopefully also answering your question, is rather than saying, rather than saying, um, we are going to, resp you know, our responses to China and Russia will imbue our foreign policy with purpose and will define the vector of U.S. foreign policy. Instead to say, let's kind of reverse the script and say, what is it that we actually are trying to accomplish in the world? 
Um, and I think that one of what I, I think that one of the challenges for the United States, there's a significant amount of strategic inertia that is built up over the course of, and really, you could say about eight decades. I mean, if you go back to the late 1930s, so U.S. foreign policy. If, uh, from, you could say, the late 1930s to the end of the Cold War, it was substantially, not entirely, but it was substantially oriented around meeting external competitors. So Imperial Japan, Nazi Germany, and then for the better part of half a century, the Soviet Union. Which is why the, when the Soviet Union collapsed, even though it was a momentous victory, militarily, diplomatically, economically, on and on for the United States, it was a Pyrrhic victory. Um, and it's, it was very interesting. Um, I encountered a number, of, a number of articles, a number of speeches, a number of testimonies, uh, circa sort of you know, late, late 1980s, early 1990s. So while there was a lot of triumphalism in the air, there was a certain disquiet beneath the surface. And, and a lot of policymakers and observers saying, well, gosh, we've had external comp competitors that have steered our foreign policy now, dating back to the late 1930s, for about 60 years. How do you craft a foreign policy, let alone pursue one? How do you even articulate the basis of your foreign policy if you don't have an external competitor to discipline it? And it was no less, and, and one of the, um, I think one of the, the articles, or one of the speech, articles and speeches that really, really shaped the book, it's Kennan's speech, uh, which was subsequently rendered as, uh, as an op-ed in the New York Times. So Kennan gives a speech uh, at the Council on Foreign Relations in February of 1994 to mark his 90th birthday. So he lived to be 101, so even at age 90, he was, it was remarkably vigorous and prolific. And so CFR invites him to give a speech uh, to mark his 90th birthday. And again, this is the heady 90s. It's 1994. A lot of triumphalism is in the air. And the Cold War had only officially ended in 1992. So he's asked to, to, to mark his birthday, to offer some reflections on the implosion of the Soviet Union, to offer some reflections on containment. Now, I think that Kennan, and you know, Kennan wouldn't have done so, but I think that Kennan would have been within his rights to take a certain kind of victory lap. I mean, he was kind of the foremost avatar of containment. I mean, he wrote, he wrote you know, the Mr. X article in Foreign Affairs. He wrote the long telegram, even though he became uh, very distressed by how containment was appropriated by his colleagues. But uh, he was kind of the foremost avatar of containment. Uh, he didn't take a victory lap in that speech. And he actually issues, you know, so he says the good news is that the Soviet Union has collapsed meaning and therefore the attendant risk of a great power war that could escalate to the nuclear, le uh, the nuclear level has substantially receded. That's the good news. He says the bad news is, and this is kind of the point that I was trying, I was kind of channeling, trying to channel Kennan just a, a couple of minutes ago. He said the bad news is we don't really have focal points in our foreign policy. We don't have the bureaucratic apparatus and we don't really have the strategic inclination to conceive of a foreign policy absent that big, large, menacing other. And so he warned his audience that the United States now, in this heady triumphalism, he warned that when it emerged from that kind of fog of triumphalism, that it was going to be at substantial risk of strategic disorientation. And I think that we see that his prediction was substantially borne out. So in the 1990s, there were a lot of debates about, we had this extraordinary inheritance of power now that the Soviet Union has collapsed, what all do we do with it? Uh, in the 2000s, counterterrorism, it provided something of a ballast, but it was a it was a partial ballast and it was a fleeting one because by the time, you know, as the 2000s are winding down, you know, the Obama administration wants to, to sort of move away from counterterrorism, focus on other priorities. The American public is becoming disillusioned with the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and so is, uh, for that matter, um, much of Congress. And then in the first part of the 2010s, we, we experiment with the pivot to Asia, we experiment with great power cooperation. Uh, nothing really sticks. I think one of the reasons a great power competition has achieved its present centrality is, um, on the one hand, it reflects real trends and real strategic anxiety that, gosh, the United States, uh, only 30 years after the alleged end of history had arrived, we were dealing with now a resurgent China and a revanchist Russia. So it's uncomfortable. There's a lot of strategic anxiety. But paradoxically, that strategic anxiety, it exists alongside a certain sense of bureaucratic comfort. Hey, we've seen this movie before. We've dealt with major competitors before. Maybe we can draw on a familiar script. Um, and so I, I think, though, we need to recognize that competition today um, is going to be substantially different from competition that existed during the Cold War. It's, yes, there will be a substantial military component, but I think that we have a vital national interest in avoiding great power war. 
Um, and I think that China and Russia, as I've, said, as I've said on a few occasions during our conversation, for all of their socioeconomic challenges at home, which are formidable, and, for, and notwithstanding their increasingly contested external environments, I think it's likely that they're going to endure. They've, each of them has defied many prognostications of collapse. I think they're likely to endure in perpetuity. And so then the question for the United States becomes, um, rather than the pursuing a decisive victory, how do you instead achieve that decisive cohabitation? All a way of saying that rather than turning to China and Russia and hoping that their behaviors will imbue our foreign policy with purpose or define its purpose, we need to overcome this, the strategic inertia that for too long has tethered our foreign policy to the existence of competitors or the search for competitors. And we instead need to say, kind of first principles, what do we seek to accomplish in the world? And it should be the, it should be the answers to that question that shape an affirmative agenda within which Selective competition with China and Russia assumes its proper role, but it shouldn't be competition that dictates our purposes in the world. Right. Asking that central question of who are we, what's our values, Absolutely. what's our mission set, how do we want to promote peace and stability in, their, in, in the international system. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I really, I really think that that's a very important point and something that certainly this book highlights. Uh, I want to quickly turn to our audience. We have about 10 minutes left, so perhaps we'll keep some of these questions a bit short. Um, and I should but respond briefly. I go on. No, no, long. don't, don't worry briefly. at all. <laughs> I and, and I can briefly. see that we've got some members of the audience that yeah. are familiar with your work and with this book. Uh, so I would like to open it up for questions, if there are any. Sure. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much. This is a fantastic yeah. talk. In fact, I, thank you. Uh, in fact, you touched upon things that I wanted to ask about. So um, maybe quickly, I'm just going to follow up on what you said. Sure. So um, there is the argument that both the Russian and the Chinese regimes are not stable. And uh, we just recently had an event, and one of our panelists uh, from the Jamestown Foundation said that we're looking at uh, you know, Russia receding as a power. Its ability to impose its writ in the Federation as it exists is weakening because of Ukraine. Uh, where do you see that in, in the sense of if you had to forecast, you know, uh, and I know I'm asking a lot, but would love to get your thoughts. And the same thing for China. It's, a, its issue isn't military. It is issue is financial sustainability. Uh, and then, you know, it goes through periods of crises and then jumps back up. Uh, its business model is one that's geared towards maintaining full employment. So in the, what do you make of that in terms of, from the lens of great power competition, and what should the U.S. be worried about? So I, something that I worry about with, with both, actually, you know, with both Russia and China, and I think that we've seen, I think this concern uh, exacerbated by COVID-19 has been, um, the insularity of the inner circles for Vladimir Putin, the inner so the inner, Vladimir Putin's inner circle, uh, Xi Jinping's inner circle, uh, it's, and I think that at least Xi Jinping, it seems that, it seems though now that he increasingly is going to be sort of re-emerging sort of physically on the international stage and, and traveling to some of these four, and I, and I think that that will be helpful for Chinese diplomacy, um, but during the course of the pandemic, they really weren't traveling. They weren't traveling, they weren't, and when you're not traveling, when you're not meeting people in, in person, I mean, leaving aside just geopolitics, I mean, even just sort of in our day-to-day -day lives, you know, when, when families, when family members are not seeing each other in person for months on end, years on end, when close friends are not seeing each other for months on end or years on end, um, you, you lose touch, you lose a sense of, you know, what are the issues in, in this family member's life? What's going on with this, with this close friend? And similarly, if you're not present physically, on the, not traveling, you're not present on the international stage for such a long period of time, I think you do lose touch. You do kind of lose a, a certain connection with the reality. And it's very clear. I mean, yes, Russia's military is, is recalibrating now, this war of attrition. I, I think some of the statements that you know, Ukraine has, you know, the military momentum has decisively shifted in Ukraine's favor, I think that some of those statements are overwrought. But Russia is, you know, Russia is, is recalibrating. Uh, but certainly, if you look at, I think, there's no question that there was a marked gap. There was a marked gap between how Russia probably envisioned that the initial stages of its war in Ukraine would go and how the war actually ended up going. And I think that that reflects either just genuinely poor operational guidance that went to Putin or, and this is perhaps even more concerning, even if there was a sense that Russia was ill-equipped to undertake this uh, invasion, that there was a fear of speaking truth to power. 
I think similarly with Xi Jinping, you have to worry about sort of the growing insularity of his inner circle because you see a doubling down on zero COVID policies that are proven inimical to Chinese growth prospects. You see a doubling down on uh, cracking down on major technology companies. Uh, you see this sort of embrace of a new development concept that seems to prioritize uh, the rule of the Chinese Communist Party more so than the embrace of market reforms. You see a doubling down on counterproductive diplomacy that is estranged China from many advanced industrial democracies. Now, Russia and China, I mean, they will learn and they will presumably, they will recalibrate, but I do worry about the sort of who is advising uh, Vladimir Putin, who is advising Xi Jinping. Um, so I think that's, that's a real concern. Um, and when you have uh, and with, I think with both with Putin and with Xi, uh, they are likely to be, I mean, there have been some speculations about Putin's health, but I, I, I don't want to you know, weigh in on those speculations because they are just that. But I think that we will be dealing with Putin and Xi for, some, for a while to come. And I think with Xi Jinping, uh, barring some kind of catastrophe, he's likely to secure a third term at the helm of the Chinese Communist Party with the, the conclusion of the 20th Party Congress. So, we're going to be dealing with these two leaders most likely for, for a while to come. And if their inner circles are shrinking, uh, it does raise, that shrinkage does raise significant questions about the, uh, the wisdom of policy that's being conducted at home and abroad, the brittleness of the political system. And again, I, you know, my, my hunch, you know, my hunch is that, you know, Russia and China, they are likely to endure. I think that they both are likely to avoid kind of a spectacular regime collapse. But they are setting themselves up for more political frailty, more political brittleness, um, less um, sort of a less diverse marketplace of ideas to inform policy, and that's never good. Um, and I think I'll just make one last comment. Uh, you know, I do think, uh, you know, whatever one might think about, you know, the framing, I, I do think that one advantage, you know, democracies do have over autocracies is there is more, um, there are greater mechanisms inbuilt for. Uh, taking stock of misguided policies, learning from those policies, and correcting. There are more, there's more of a self-corrective, there are more self-corrective uh, mechanisms that are inbuilt in democracies and in autocracies. And so I think that what we should be thinking about is, will Russia, in terms of its policies at home and abroad, will China, in terms of its policies at home and abroad, do we see signs of recalibration, or do we see signs of doubling down on policies that are proven to be misguided? If the former, that should actually be encouraging. If the latter, it should be concerning about, I think, political uh, brittleness and frailty at home. Are there any other questions uh, that we can briefly address before we wrap up? Yeah, I have two, so I'll ask my shorter question, uh, which is about the process of writing the book. Um, you're obviously writing about a moving target here. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and I, I'm somewhat Indeed. selfishly asking this because I'm writing my dissertation oh, also congrats. about a moving target here. Yeah. And so I'm curious how you kind of dealt with like the broadening temporal scope of your work. And at what point do you just like pull the plug on all the news and all the chatter and just sit down to write? And then how did you, how did you make that decision? I didn't make the decision. Uh, the editor made the decision. It was painful. It was painful. So I, <laughs> I submitted the first iteration of this book uh, shortly before the United States withdrew from Afghanistan. Then the United States uh, withdraws from Afghanistan. I, I said to my editor, I think that I need to, and I, I briefly in, in, the, in the book, particularly in the introduction, I try to take stock of that development a little bit. Uh, and, then, um, and then I kind of thought, it's Again, relatively, I th relatively, it seemed that the world had kind of calmed down a little bit. There was, there was speculation about what America's withdrawal from Afghanistan meant for America's role in the world. Had, you know, was, did this mark sort of the inauguration of the post-American era and so on and so forth. But relatively, uh, there was a period of calm. And so I was, you know, we were doing copy editing. I was making some light updates here and there. And then you start seeing this kind of this mobilization of Russian troops along the Ukrainian border. And I'm thinking, there's part of my mind saying, Russia's, Russia's not actually going to invade, are they? Because I was thinking to myself, just think about all the military costs that's going to incur, the economic, the diplomatic costs that's going to incur. But then there was another part of my mind saying, well, if they invade, you can't, and then they actually did invade. And so um, I realized that I was going to try my editor's patience, but I, I had a conversation with my editor and I said, I can't submit, I can't in good conscience submit this book to, you know, we can't. I said it would look bad for, for, for all of us. Um, if I submit this book to the publisher and it goes to print and there's no mention of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, people will say, like, Ali, have you been living under a rock? And so we had a conversation and I realized that it would be too, so with the, 
with the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan, it was, it's a momentous development, but I felt that I was able to suitably address it by making just certain tweaks to the, the body of the, the manuscript. With Russia's invasion of Ukraine, there was just no way that I could make sort of tweaks here and there to different chapters. I said, I'm going to have to write, I'm going to have to just write sort of a separate, not a full chapter, but let me at least write an afterwards. So my editor and I agreed. So I wrote an afterward. I tried to at least offer some initial reflections on Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the implications for my book, and then also the linkage that was being made between Ukraine and Taiwan. Um, but at a certain point, uh, and, and the editor said, okay, now we've done the afterward and we have to, we have to, go, to, we have to go to print. And so at a certain point, um, you do have to, to stop and you have to, you have to say, look, the book is invariably going to be somewhat out of date and you can't do anything about that. But what you can try to do, and what I try to do with the book is, I'm, <laughs> I'm glad that the book, I should say, I'm glad I didn't write a book saying, you know, uh, by my, my thesis holds that Russia will not invade a sovereign country, but that would have been a disaster for, you know, for the book. What I tried to do instead was um, recognizing that the book would be invariably somewhat out of date, but could I write a book offering some, some general propositions about U.S. foreign policy, some general propositions about how the United States could be more competitive in world affairs. And I hope, I hope that those, those broader propositions about America's place in the world, America's competitive advantages, the need for competitive equipoise, I hope that those broader propositions hopefully have some shelf life so that uh, regard, and, and I would also, uh, and, and I don't say this just you know, there's sort of a selfish, in, every writer has this instinct that no matter what happens in the world, you adduce that as evidence that, see, my thesis was exactly on point. So I, I don't want to make that argument. But I will say, what I do think Russia's invasion of Ukraine, this uptick in cross trade tensions, I do think that they, what they have done is they've placed into even sharper relief, into even starker relief, the limits to, you, to, the limits to unilateral U.S. influence. And I think that they've underscored, even, for me at least, even more dramatically, the need for the United States to concede the limits to its influence, its unilateral influence, and to say we need to apply ourselves much more creatively and much more energetically to devising a foreign policy that isn't dictated by the whims of our competitors. And so for me, Russia's invasion of Ukraine and this uptick in crosshair tensions, they've been very sobering. They highlight the limits to U.S. influence, but they also, one, they highlight that Russia and China do make strategic mistakes strategic mistakes that give us a little bit more freedom of maneuver in our foreign policy uh, and to pursue that more affirmative foreign policy that isn't beholden to, that isn't tethered to, that isn't predicated upon the decisions of our competitors. And look, um, we will be dealing, I think, with China and, and Russia in perpetuity, but we will also be dealing with other competitive challenges. It's not just China and Russia. We'll be dealing with other competitive challenges. We'll be dealing with an increasingly fraught nexus of great power competition and transnational challenges. And so I think that as time passes, the imperative of articulating and pursuing a more affirmative foreign policy is going to increase, not diminish. And I think that's really, the, I think, the big takeaway from the book and hopefully one that will, will endure regardless of uh, what other events intrude, but for the time being, at least, I won't have to try my editor's patience any longer than I already have. So. <laughs> Absolutely. It, it, it is a very difficult feat. I know I can see audience members right now who have also experienced this. I know, Kamran, <laughs> you just recently wrote a report that encountered yeah. many of these same issues uh, with, the, with, with, with the withdrawal and with protests and then, of course, with this, uh, this war in Ukraine. Uh, of course, now, unfortunately, our, our time is up, so I would love to just thank our audience members, our camera crew, uh, and of course uh, our author Ali, who has uh, very kindly given us uh, a lot of time to talk about this wonderful book. Uh, and it's very insightful, very timely, America's Great Power Opportunity. Uh, thanks so much for being with us today. And I would like to remind those who are tuning in, also attending in person, that we have this discussion recorded on the New Lines Institute for Strategy and Policy YouTube page. It will be uploaded shortly. You can also find additional analyses, book webinars, and events that relate to this topic and other geopolitical uh, challenges and, and crises of interest to in the United States on our website at www.newlinesinstitute.org. Uh, thank you all. Have a wonderful day and a great rest of your week. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me.